Welcome back everybody to Desktop Inventions. I'm Ashton and this week we've got a ton of new and exciting news to dive into. So we'll have more talk on tariffs on 3D printing filaments, amazing breakthroughs in non-planar 3D printing slicing, and a super insightful interview with CNC Kitchen and the CEO of Bamboo Labs, and so much more. So without further ado, let's dive right in. All right, first up on the docket, we've got more to talk about on tariffs and 3D printing filament. So listen up because prices might be changing in a big way. So starting on May 2nd, the US is removing the $800 de minimis exemption on all imports from China. So this means even a single $15 spool of filament can now be hit with massive import taxes. Previously, if your order was under $800, you could buy from Chinese brands like Isun, Sunlu, and others with no added duty or customs bill. But after May 2nd, that's all changing because all Chinese shipments will be taxed no matter how small. So let's break it down in this table here. We can see the current status of US made filaments are around $20 to $30 per kilogram, and Chinese brands are ranging from $10 to $15 per kilogram, depending if you buy it from Amazon or AliExpress. So Chinese brands are cheaper, uh, no shocks here. So after May 2nd, if you purchase smaller orders with postal delivery services, there will be up to 148% tariff added. That's 3.1% base import duty plus 25% for section 301, and then an additional 120% reciprocal tariff. So the US made filament stays the same at that 20 to $30 price range, and the China based filament could increase as much as 25 to $38. Now, if we look at bulk shipments after May 2nd, they are set to increase even more with the same 3.1% base import duty, 25% for the Section 301, and then a larger 176% reciprocal tariff for a total of a 204% tariff. So yeah, if you're getting your filament from AliExpress, eBay, or Overseas Direct, you could be paying up to two to three times more starting in just a couple weeks. But that's not guaranteed. For sure, companies are clever and they're gonna play all sorts of games to try and get around this. For example, it's going to be pretty quick and easy for some companies to set up some filament manufacturing lines in Vietnam, for example, and then go through that route to get into the US. But that could lead to a hit in quality as well. So we'll see what happens there to see how much prices actually go up. So what should you do? So here's my suggestion. Buy now if there's any filament brands that you really need or want from China, like Isun, Overture, etc. And if you want to support US manufacturing, now is a great time to start trying American-made filament brands. Companies like 3D Fuel, Atomic Filament, and Hatchbox, and others offer solid quality with consistent pricing and zero tariffs. And if you want a great breakdown of Made in USA products, you can check out Bryce's 3D Prints. He posted a super helpful Google Docs comparing US-based filament options with prices and where to buy them. I'll link Bryce's post down in the description, so whether you're stocking up or switching suppliers, Now's the time to plan ahead before this filament price hike becomes the new normal. Okay, next up we have to talk about a genius and an absolute legend named Joshua Bird. So he just dropped a YouTube video on us talking about a demo of his new S4 model, which is a whole new level of non-planar slicing. So previously there was work done on an S3 slicer from Manchester University by a team of graduate students, a team and Josh did this by himself and totally brought it to the next level. Simplifying how the slicer works all within a single Jupyter notebook. And yeah, it's open source for you to grab and try out. Although being a non-planar slicer, you can't just grab an Ender 3 and try it out. It was developed on the basis of a four axis 3D printing machine. More on that in Josh's excellent video breakdown. So why is this such a big deal? Well, there's two huge advantages to this type of printing. You can now print many new types of models with overhangs without the need for any support material. In his video, he showcased printing an upside down Benchy with no support material needed. Imagine that. So really this method can print not just 90 degree overhangs, but even over 180 degree overhangs, which is simply incredible. And for the second huge advantage with how the slicer works, it takes your original 3D model and distorts it in such a way that it removes all the overhangs. Then it slices it in a traditional method with flat layers then it undistorts the 3D model, which results in these wavy or non-planar layers. Long story short, for most prints, this gets rid of the flat layers, which cause weak areas in your prints. So now you can have prints that are strong in multiple axes. This by itself is pretty game-changing. 
So it's still experimental, but this is one of the most exciting software breakthroughs I've seen this year. I think we'll start to see a whole new category of 3D printers built around this revolutionary work on the S4 slicer that Joshua has done. Well done and kudos Joshua. Are you a fan of Starbucks? Because pretty soon you could be ordering from a 3D printed Starbucks cafe. Yup, Starbucks is 3D printing one of their new modular cafes in Brownsville, Texas, using 3D printing to slash construction time and costs. So AI was used to help design the layout and to help with the permitting process. And of course, insert buzzword here, it's part of their new plan to have a more sustainable real estate. But I'm guessing it's more about the cost and scalability with a side of sustainability. So this whole building was built like a giant vending machine. No bathrooms, no place to sit. They only accept walk up and drive through deliveries. It was reportedly printed in just six days, but I don't think that includes the final decoration. It was also reported that the 3D printing appears to have been carried out by Perry 3D Construction using Kobod gantry style 3D printers. Kobod's technology is a major player in construction 3D printing. In fact, it's said that the company's hardware is said to be behind 40% of all 3D printed buildings in the US. Based on some of these images, I think it's safe to say they're not using clipper input shaping on their machines, at least not yet. So this is coming soon. It's set to open next Thursday, April 24th. So if there's anyone in the area, you can check it out and let us know what you think. All right, so next topic here, Anchor has just announced a new product under their Eufy Make brand called UV Printer E1, and it's a pretty cool concept. So it prints flat 2D images like a regular inkjet printer, but it adds raised textured layers to simulate things like wood grain, leather, and even crocodile skin. So it's not quite an FDM, but it's not quite a photo printer. It's somewhere in the middle. Think of like a 2.5D printer. So some cool use cases that this kind of technology could be used for. Custom map tiles for role-playing games, textured product labels, fake wood for crafts, uh, tactile surfaces for accessibility. This could even be used for some unique marketing or packaging designs, such as textured surfaces on mugs or cups. Basically anywhere you want your print to not just look cool, but feel cool too. But here's the catch. It's Anchor and it's launching on Kickstarter on April 29th. And Anchor's last 3D printing Kickstarter, the Anchor Make M5, definitely had some backlash going on. They had delays, software issues, and even eventually canceled and couldn't deliver the V6 color changing system, which is kind of like the Bamboo Labs AMS system. Although they did give uh, users refunds on people that ordered that V6 system. So it's understandable there's definitely a huge trust gap this time around. But regardless, whether it's Anchor or someone else, what do you think of this technology? Would you use something like this? Let me know in the comments down below. Okay, here's a headline that caught my eye, and probably yours too. The world's largest 3D printing facility opens in Florida. But largest by what metric? It wasn't what I was thinking, so let's unpack it. So a company called Hattie just opened a new factory in St. Petersburg, Florida, and they're calling it the largest 3D printing facility in the world. If you're picturing rows and rows of bamboo labs or prusas cranking out benches or flexible dragons, well think again. This facility focuses on furniture and architecture. And instead of dozens of small printers, it uses a few gigantic robot arms that operate like oversized delta bots on rails. So they're printing tables, chairs, shelvings, and even wall panels, and all using recycled materials. How are they making the claim of the largest 3D printing facility? Well, it's not by the number of printers, but by the print capacity, throughput, and floor space utilization. According to Hattie, it's the largest in terms of total output volume, size of the machines, and automation efficiencies, not just unit count. In other words, this isn't the largest print farm, but it's the largest production scale print facility using additive manufacturing. So their long-term goal, to build micro factories all around the world that can locally 3D print sustainable furniture and home goods on demand. So sort of like the IKEA of the future, but instead of having a few centralized mega factories, they want to have distributed micro factories that will just 3D print furniture and items as soon as you order them. So what do you think? With having distributed micro factories focused on just 3D printing, do you think they can really get the quality of this furniture to be good enough to be accepted and really scale massively? I don't know. We'll see how it turns out in the future and see where this goes. 
All right, and the last topic, we have a must-watch interview between Stefan of CNC Kitchen and Dr. Ye Tao, the CEO of Bamboo Labs. So Stefan did a really great job of asking questions and really got into their development process and mindset. And you know he was asking good questions when the answer he got more than once was, that's a company secret. So without spoiling too much, here's a few of the topics they covered. The use of servo motors versus stepper motors, the naming origin of the H2D, a uh, calibration plate and how they plan to use that in the future, a cool story of how they developed the AMS alongside RFID tags to accurately estimate the amount of remaining filaments. So there was a secret PTFE tube that was accidentally shipped to Stefan and leaked now, carbon fiber rails and some of the drawbacks there, and of course Dr. Tao's explanation of the difficult controversy of closing their MQTT protocol but finally opening it back up with a developer mode. So if you're a Bamboo Labs fanboy, or you're just curious about the product development process of 3D printing, this is definitely worth a watch. So I'll put the link to that video down in the description down below. I highly recommend watching this interview. It was so good and totally worth it. All right, with the news topics out of the way, let's jump over to the printables and Thingiverse 3D prints of the week. All right, for the Thingiverse print of the week, last week we had these handles for the filament cutters when your handles get broke and fall off. Um, these were made by Olier, and last week I was complaining how these uh, grips were a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and guess what, Olier heard me. So now he made a smooth version of this handle. So you can put the smooth version on one side and the finger grip on the other side, like this, or you can do smooth on both sides. Really, it's up to whatever you prefer. So shout out to Olier for listening and giving very quick customer feedback. All right, for the Printables Print of the Week, we have this print in place motor fidget. So it's this opposed cylinder, two piston little engine that you can turn the, uh, turn the knob here and you can watch how that crankshaft moves and those pistons go back and forth. It's really fun to play with. You can also uh, spin it. Um, really great concept here. I love this because I'm a motorhead. So awesome design here by Mars 3D. And I know what you're thinking, two cylinders, that's pretty cool. And of course, I was thinking the same thing. Somebody remixed it. We have William Arsenault here with the eight cylinder version. I think he made a four, six and eight cylinder version. So this is also a print in place with eight cylinders, which is pretty cool. So a really fun fidget to play with and a little bit mesmerizing to just watch all the mechanical moving parts here. And if you're also thinking the same thing as me, that's not far enough. So I want to make a V-twin version of this. So I made the version one here, which didn't work uh, too well, but it's got one piston in there, starting to work. Then I made a V-twin version that uh, has two pistons working. And I think I still need a, a few more design iterations before I post this. The challenge here being you have to print, uh, print it down like this, and you've got a bunch of floating parts there that has a bunch of ugly support material that I'm not quite happy with yet. So I'm gonna iterate this design a little bit more and if I have time this week, hopefully post that online as well. And you know it, this is the V-twin version. Once this gets uh, smoothed out, it can be scaled and patterned out to be a V6 or V8 version. You know that's where this is gonna go. So that's it for the Thingiverse and Printables Print of the Week. All right, and now it's time for the shorts. This week had some really good posts that I got some good laughs out of, so let's see if we can get a laugh out of those together. So this person needed to print some uh, ASA but didn't have an enclosure, so he made a poor man's enclosure using some cardboard and dubbed it the X1 carton. Pretty hilarious, and it works. Just don't do this unsupervised. So here we have a test engineer in the lab coming up with a new standardized test that we must now all do on our TPU prints. Hold my beverage. And finally, if you grew up in the 90s or the 2000s, you're all too familiar with the floating DVD icon. So we're just going to leave this here and see if it ever hits both corners. All right, that's it for the 3D printing news topics this week. Thank you so much for sticking to the end of the video. And let me know your honest feedback down below. Do you like hearing some of the tariff mitigation talks? Do you like hearing about new exciting consumer 3D printers or just 3D printing news in general? Do you like the 3D prints of the week? Uh, really, I'm doing this for you guys. So let me know in the comments down below what areas you like and maybe what areas I could improve or keep expanding on in the future. Doing this for you guys. So until then, I'll see you here next week at Desktop Inventions. 
Okay, and for the printables print of the week, we have this print mother. Waiting for the car alarm to go off. Waiting for the car alarm to go off. Waiting for the, okay. And so for the printables print of the week, we have this mother. Load of 3D printing news.